Here we are in the editing suites of the man, the legend, filmmaker, producer, so many titles, Danny Finkelman. Thank you so much for being on the podcast Thanks, today. Mayor. It's a real honor. You really. know, it's, it's good to see you in the flesh because I feel like I've been living vicariously through your Instagram. You travel a lot for your productions, for all your projects, and uh, we're going to get to that soon. What I'm just reminiscing right now is sitting in this room and I see a lot more of these uh, the movie posters that you've been uh, busy with over these past couple of years right. hanging on the wall. Um, I like what you did with the shade of this. What is this? Burgundy? What is red? I'm colorblind. It's <laughs> brighter than it was last time. Right. Um, but last time I sat here, and what I have, I want to really bring start off this conversation with, and what's so special for this podcast for me is that when I moved back to New York after backpacking the world for <clears throat> half a year, over half a year, I was, you know, I loved, I was figured out through that travels that I love video, I love filmmaking, something I wanted to get into, but I had nowhere to start. Right. And um, I remember coming to this very office that we're sitting in right now. And uh, and you yeah I reached out to you because you were the one who was making music videos you were out there in the in the orthodox world and who was dabbling and making creating awesome content and I was like you know how can I get involved can you give me some tips and you really laid it down for me and you're really helpful and, and I remember working on some of the short films that you were working on at that time right. and that was really a gateway for me to meet some of my contacts I worked and I started working on some feature films but kudos thank you to you I wanted to thank you for that that was a really great bro let me tell you I remember the day that you, like yesterday the, yeah. the day you came in here you were like listen I just came back from um, Singapore yes right that's and right. I want to go into filmmaking and you inspired me right away because you were so motivated motivated people inspire me when you're like I'm going to the top I was like I asked you what's your objective You're like, I want to be a director, a filmmaker. I'm like, oh, nice. You want to be a director? Well, you know, you got to start from somewhere. Right. And I was like, this is this guy's going to make it because he knows what he wants. He's so enthusiastic about it. I remember on set, you were, everybody loved you. They fell in love with you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> much before sense. everybody, the world got to know you. Yeah. <laughs> we got to know you. You were like, they were crazy. Oh, mayor, mayor, mayor. You were like such a motivator on set. I wish I had... The mayor now, what I had then. Right. Are you still available? <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I, we're, we're all starting to work on stuff. I, I, I really loved it. You really gave me the time. And I, I was just so excited. I was, I was, I am hungry. I'm passionate. Right. And, um, and it was just great to like be on, uh, for me, for the first time. I worked, you know, I was in camp skits and stuff. But being on like a, a real set with line producers and PAs and key PAs and, and all that jazz and all the bells and whistles that you were running, it was really cool to just make those those friendships and connections. There was Till today, I'm in touch with some of the people. And Samantha, I remember, was one of the great P yeah. social producer uh -huh. she was and and there was beer uh he was a really great right. guy and <laughs> Mauricio. Uh, Mauricio of course <laughs> yeah with his amazing talents and his um studio that he has in Long Island City so like yeah it was a really incredible start and you were so and you were so helpful and what I appreciated was that sometimes you come in, in this industry and you meet people who are sort of hold all their cards to their chest right and they don't you know express and they don't share so much they sort of want to keep you at a distance and keep you small I never felt that from you, Danny. I really felt like you you were there, you were, you had your hunger, you were passionate, and you were open and willing to, to share that with with people who were interested in it, like myself. I really appreciate that, Mayor. And you know, because I remember watching the Oscars back when I was a teenager, when Matt Damon and Ben Affleck won mm. for Goodwill Hunting for screenwriting. Yeah. And they gave their Oscar speech and they said, No matter what, with all our challenges along the way in Hollywood trying to make it, we stuck to each other. And that kind of like really inspired me that you can't survive in this industry being a one-man band. This is not a one-man band. It's all about collaboration. And I feel like now also in our quote-unquote small Jewish filmmakers industry, we n maybe we don't necessarily do Jewish content, but we're all Jewish filmmakers from the community, so to speak. It's all about we should collaborate. It shouldn't be like a, you know, a shop opening a competition against another shop. It's all about collaboration. We should have our own community. And I feel that way from you too reaching out to me to come here today and, and you know, to be together with you. And now that you're, you passed all of us by, <laughs> by tenfold, nah, no, you know, no. by becoming a mega celeb, <laughs> here you are not forgetting. I appreciate that, Mayor. I really do. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, listen, I, 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 it's, I realized that through, I mean, when you go, when you watch the Oscars, you brought that up as a good example, it's not just one person getting up there. And when that person, let's say it's the main actor gets up right. and the lead actor, there's a list of people who are there thinking and thinking. And we sometimes forget, like the filmmaking, what's beautiful about the filmmaking process is that it takes this team, you know, not one person, yeah. and whether it's filmmaking, whether it's starting a business, whatever it may be, it takes a team effort to make that happen and to appreciate the people along the way. And to, exactly. and, and ultimately we're all here 
you're you know trying to make awesome content, stuff that are creative, something that's fun, meaningful, that makes someone laugh or move them to tears, whatever it may be, it's all about that human experience. And if you're not enjoying the process, because we were just talking about earlier with uh, some of the crew members, you know, about you know having dreams and starting up from the bottom, so to speak, and there's really no there. I mean, I mean, there is you know, as I you know I've, I had my own aspirations and dreams, but I realized. I've sometimes gotten so caught up with the sh- hustle and bustle that I, some, I didn't, I got stressed out about the pro, about, about the about the process. I didn't appreciate right. the process. And I'm like, oh no, I gotta get this done so I can do the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. You get stuck in this rat race. At least I felt. And I was like, whoa, I gotta slow down because isn't this why? If it's not fun anymore, why am I doing it? it? So how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep? How do you keep it? Um... So first of all, I you know, there's nothing more that I enjoy than traveling and meeting new people. I could. Honestly, say that right now I have real friends in Morocco, Japan, Berlin. You know, it's so many places where I've been shooting with the crews and just developed friendships and relationships and real great environments. And anytime, it's like a network. I, I see it like a Chabad network. Mm. It's like everywhere around, where's the Chabad house? Where's the Chabad house? I see it the same way here. It's like you go to a new country. All you got to do, oh, you're a filmmaker? I'm a filmmaker. Boom, we click. And if we don't, there's a problem. Something's <laughs> wrong here. Right. So definitely, that's so much fun for me to connect to new people. I love people. I love every time getting a new project, new ideas, you know, whether uh, documentary related, politically motivated, or whatever it is, new stories, new ideas. It keeps me going. Obviously, there are challenges. I'm sure you know. There are challenges. You know, we hustle. I get up in the morning. Sometimes I'm like, oh, again, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. sometimes the project takes forever. Some of the project is, go- is going quickly. But overall, I always tell my wife, look, I could have been a shower curtain salesman. Wow. Not, That's not, a very specific. Nothing. I'm uh, sorry. No offense. No, to offense. no shower curtain sure, salesman. Sure, sure, sure. There are great ones out there. But it's not for me. Mm-hmm. I could have been something, you know, that doesn't fit me. The fact that I am able to pursue my talents and that I have a wife that supports it and supports me while I'm traveling is like fine go do it. fulfill your dream fine I'll be home with the kids for 10 days while you go out traveling wow, that's incredible What's I support? give her a lot of um feedback how do you call it um credit. Call like a vote credit credit to her yeah yeah so when you when you got when, when you got married did were you doing film and well, let's go let's go back before then what was film always a passion of yours and if so how what steps did you take to create this reality that you're making a right. living off your passion. So ever since I was a kid, I was obsessed with film. In fact, back in the 90s where I, where I was a teenager, obviously we didn't have the internet yet. What we had was a huge, thick encyclopedia called the F- Video Movie Guide or something like that. You wanted to see information about any movie, you gotta go through it, the <laughs> alphabetical order. Oh yeah, here we go, Father of the Bride. Seven out of ten, nice. And, and that's how you, so I wrote my own film review. I oh, had my own nice. book, like a real geek. Wow, that's <laughs> hilarious. I made my brother crazy. I was, <laughs> we, 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 I, would, I was very much into foreign films, French, Italian, the works, mm-hmm. and uh, Fellini movies. Oh, First Fellini, of all, sure. completely boring as hell for my brother. Like, what the hell? And I used to order DVDs from, not DVDs, back then, VHS videos from Columbia House. Whatever, you remember those? Yo, I you, mean, you're like, Columbia House, that's like <laughs> me before my time. I mean, I remember Tommy K's. That Last was like from the, the past, yeah. The blockbuster, is that like a blockbuster? Columbia House used to like pay for one and get like eight videos for free. So I used to open different accounts. Oh, I hope I'm not. From the get-go. Get, yeah. No, it's all good. It's, it's, it's just I had a whole collection of those videos. Oh, yeah, Blockbuster, The Works, the, the, uh-huh. the local, you know, neighborhood video store and i used to watch a movie pause it midway and i'd be like eh, i have to think about this i have to think about this and they're like come on continue the movie no 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 let me think about it. let me think about it i have to think about what he did here so i was always obsessed with wow. movies. wow and you were doing this from how old when you were um, analyzing these, these movies i would say 12. that young yeah wow you were just fascinated by like what it took. What were the angles? What was the what production? Yeah, I loved per- seeing good performances, good mm-hmm. stories. You know, just about like Spielberg says, it's all about it's all about telling a story. That's you know that's the the name of the game. Yeah. And a good story really spoke to me. I remember like the movie the movie that really spoke to me then was Schindler's List that we just um, actually they just had twenty five years for its re- to its release. Incredible. I watched it. I kid you not, Mayor. At least, and I'm counting, 63 times. 
The whole movie. I'm obsessed with that movie. And it really shaped up the way what I'm involved today with the Holocaust survivors and all. And right. and, and, and generally, the, the, the way it was shot, the cinematography, the performances, everything. A powerful, powerful film. Yeah, yeah. really powerful. And uh, that's really how I got started, you know? Wow, yeah. yeah. You did bring up recently, you just mentioned the um, the Holocaust band that you're, you've are you been really obsessed about. And right. really, you see, they pop up a lot in your films. And so do um, some of the stars like God Elbaz and, and This in Black. How did those connections come into play? How did, like, you know, it seems like those... Um, the artists. The music. artists, yeah. Those collaborations. So those are the two passions of mine in life, movies and music. So mm-hmm. first, I, I was obviously, you know, I loved movies, and I didn't do anything about it. I actually did go to NIFA, New York Film Academy, yeah. for a while, but it wasn't a real film school. I mean, they teach you the, you know, kind of like the basics, and that's it. And then I dropped it all. I went through my own journey. I became more what was religious. that journey, man? Talk to so, me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't be okay. skipping no parts right here. You know what? Let me start. <laughs> let me go backwards. Bring it back. Let's rewind. Okay, there we go. Let me start with the fact I was born, you know, I'm, I'm from Israel. Okay, as you can yeah. detect. You're, and, you're hiding uh, the Israeli accent I'm pretty well. It. You're and not you know, so and you know how I hide it? Huh? With a southern accent. Sometimes you'll hear me saying like, Ra, so what you're just... And people are like, what? Wait, where, 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 where are you from? <laughs> They're like, no, I'm just trying to hide my, my real accent. <laughs> and, um, so you're from Israel. I'm from Israel, born and bred Jerusalem. Uh-huh. My parents from the former from, Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine. That's but I was born already in Israel. A religious family, an Orthodox uh, family. Well, they became religious along the way. Okay. You know, they, when I was a kid, they became somewhat religious, not Hasidic. And I was my father was a doctor, working in uh, Hadassah. It's a hospital in Jerusalem. And at the age of seven, I was all of a sudden taken over by a rare eye disease. I was. They found out I was allergic to none other than the sun, really? like a vampire. You know, vampires can <laughs> don't exist during the day. They cannot tolerate the sun. That's how I was. Any sun, my eyes are closed. There are shades at the windows. There's a little bit of sun. My eyes are swollen, tear, and it's, it itches. And I, I cannot, they have to tie my hands so I shouldn't, so I shouldn't rub, itch my eyes, rub, rub my eyes. eyes. Yeah. Anyway, the situation went from worse to worse. And I literally, literally, um, couldn't so take, you I couldn't, couldn't get leave, up. You couldn't I, go to school. I, I, you couldn't. So yeah, every morning it took me about an hour just to open my eyes. The amount of substances of, I don't even know what that came out of my eyes during at night, kind of like glued my eyelids to my skin. I couldn't oh open my eyes. Wow. And I went from doc. My father, being a doctor there, got me the best doctors. I went to professors, to experts. None of them could figure out what could be done. And I went to school. And I was sitting there with like these heavy duty sunglasses. Back then, the 1980s, we're talking about Robocop. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, Robocop. yeah. Robocop. Yeah, Somebody sure. like, oh, Robocop, Robocop. Because it was like the, these Terminator Robocop glasses sitting. And it still didn't help. I was like sitting there. All my photos from my childhood, I'm sitting there like that. At some point, the doctors told my father, listen, probably when he reaches 13, he's going to be blind. Because at this point, there's nothing we can be, that can be done. We tried oh every kind of medication possible and drops and creams and, and everything. I yeah. went to alternative medicine. I went to Kabbalists. I went to rabbis. I went to this, I remember, Moroccan woman who literally spat in my eyes twice. Are you kidding? I kid you not. Mara- oh, okay. I love the Moroccans. It's a great food. Crazy <laughs> traditions. Crazy. Wow. I'm telling you. And I was what? like, is this supposed to help me right now? <laughs> Chamomile tea and then a spit. And then like, it was, it was a journey were of depression because I was told that very soon, I was already 11 at the time, it started yeah. when I was seven. By 11, I was told, I'm gone. You better start getting prepared. And I, and I had how a phobia. You, as a, how do, as an 11-year-old, do you handle that kind of information? That's crazy. I don't know. I mean, never now to that... See the, never see again. Yeah, to never see again. I'm thinking to myself, how am I not going to be able to watch anything, to read anything, to look at my parents, to see my future wife, and hey... Am I ever going to get married? I mean, who's going to want to marry a blind guy? I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, I, I, a lot of thoughts that are going on in my mind. Wow, eleven year old thinking about marriage. That's yeah. that's 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 what's the actual reason for you right there. You know, the pressure totally starts right. early. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, at that point, my whole family makes a huge move. We move to the New York. 
some kind of a divine providence, as I call it today. They, they moved because of your eye condition? No, they moved because my father got some kind of an offer to be to work in his field in New York. Okay. So we made the move. And my now we stayed for the first month in Crown Heights because my father had some friends you know over there, some patients and friends. So we stayed by someone. And before you know it, I found myself at the first Shabbat in the United States. I was in 770 by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And I'm right by his feet. And, uh, you know, I really absorbed what I was able to see. It was much easier for me to be in 770 because for those who've been there, it's like there is no sunlight coming in. There are no windows. Yeah. So it's I a kind massive of like, synagogue that's in the basement of a building. Exactly. Yeah. And Sunday, I was standing on line. It was a long line. I'm standing with my sunglasses. And finally, I reached the rabbi, the Rebbe. And I'm like, Rebbe, please give me a blessing. My eyes shouldn't hurt. Because we were told, even though I went through so many rabbis and everything, and nothing helped, right. this specific person who tried to persuade my dad, like, listen, he's, he's got to get the bracha. This, this man is different. I'm telling this rabbi is different. This rabbi is different from the rest. What can you lose? Worst kind of woes, you'll make a few bucks. Mm-hmm. Fine. I'm standing online. I'm in pain. It's May 1989. I'm 11 years old. Wow. I wasn't born yet. No? No. I'm a that old? Nine Bro, old. oh no. <laughs> anyway, keep going, keep going with the story. <laughs> <clears throat> Scratch that. <laughs> so, I'm standing online, and I finally reached the Rebbe, and I'm thinking, what language am I, ta- am I talking to? English, I didn't speak at the time. Nothing, not a word. Hebrew, which I spoke, I didn't know the Rebbe speaks Hebrew. Russian, I knew he spoke, and I knew some Russian from my parents. Ah. So I spoke to him in Russian. Cool. And I was like, Rebbe, could you give me a blessing? My eyes shouldn't hurt. And I told him in Yiddish, May you be healthy, may you be successful. Now, I didn't know what the Rebbe responded till many years later when I actually found the video through uh, Jem. And the Rebbe answered back, Amen, on my blessings. Then he said to me three times in Russian, in everything, everything, everything that you do, you should have success. Anyway, to bring all this, you know, I personally am very cynical to all these magic stories with rabbis and stuff, but this is a true story that happened to me. Yeah. After four and a half years of torture, pain in my eyes, give or take a month and a half later, everything went away completely. Completely. Just like that. Just like that. You didn't change your medication, you go... Nothing. I, I went to a checkup, to a local doctor. First we thought maybe it's the different environment, maybe the sun shines here, it's some kind, somewhat different. I said, there's nothing. I don't see anything. It's gone. Wow. To this day... I could look, I'm looking at, out the window right yeah. now at the sun, nothing. And I was always wondering, hmm, the rabbi told me three times in everything, everything, everything. And we know that every, every word has meaning. Why right. did he tell it to me three times? So that was the first everything, my physical eyes being cured. Then my spiritual eyes were somewhat being cured. Mm. How I got into becoming a follower of that same rabbi. I thought I was an art dealer. And I dealt with many art pieces of different Judaica pieces okay. and some of them were Chabad rabbis the Chabad rabbis Judaica art actually there's one very famous we see all the Lubavitch dynasty all the Rebbeim of walking, walking down yeah walking down the street right, sure and the, that's the, famous one sure. right that, that was from me that was my idea which I summoned an artist in Vienna wow and, that was your creation to put yeah. that together I told totally yeah. that was that still today is a very exactly. hot piece very, very hot creative piece. yes so you had this idea Wow, I want to take a pause for a second. That's good. We're talking about right now a, 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 uh, a quite a famous uh, painting right. that has all, right, like you were saying, the seven rabbis of, of the Chabad dynasty right. walking Robinson down the street. From the window and, and yeah. the parents. That was one of them. There's another one of the Rebbe as a child. How did you get inspired about that? We'll get back to the story, but yeah. how, what inspired you for that painting? That's a really, that's so actually, my, fam- my father was an art dealer. for some. When he came to America, besides for being working in medicine, he was a lover of art, and he partnered up with someone in Europe and they started distributing art. Art were basically originals. We have a few galleries to this day in Brooklyn, in Vienna, and in Jerusalem. And also reproductions on canvas. Mm-hmm. So we started summoning different artists and giving them not only Chabad, different Satmer and Babov and Vishnets and all these combinations. They're, they're not Photoshop, they're originals. So they're, the originals exist. Sure. And in Chabad, you had the Rebbe as a child and all the Rebbe behind him. All these right. combinations. Yes. Those were more my ideas because I personally insisted on having a Chabad dynasty series. Mm-hmm. And that actually led me to come to Crown Heights because I saw so many pieces of, those, of that painting 
that more and more I did a lot of business in Crown Heights. And before you know it, somebody took like, hey, who are you? What's your name? Uh, yeah, come, let's study together. How old are you now in this part of the story? At that part of my story, I am 22. 22 years old. Got it. So you're yeah. an art dealer. You're coming with these great ideas. Yeah, I live, in, I live in Boca Raton, Florida. Okay. I come back and forth. And, you know, there's a saying in the Torah called, Vehayu enecha ro'ot et morecha. And your eyes shall see your teachers, your masters. And then I understood that was the second everything the Rebbe told me. By showing the world him, that those paintings of seeing him, the masters, my spiritual eyes have opened up. Mm. And that one thing led to the other. I got married. At, at that point, I was like many others. You know, the stories are like, I'm, I'm dropping everything. I'm becoming Chabad, full-fledged. Mm-hmm. Going, it's, I remember even before that, I was sitting in Boca Raton. I loved studying Hasidut. The inside of Hasidus, loved it. Fascinating. Fascinating. The, the philosophy. I was like, oh my God, what we learned in Yeshiva back in the day, like the splits, you know, the sea splits and you walk in between. Like, who gives a, I mean, like, How's that relate to me How's now? How's that relate to me? What kind of a Disney fantasy story is this? And then when I started learning Hasidut, I understood like, wow, just like the sea, the whole world which is concealed and the dry land is revealed, splitting the sea means you split your subconscious mind, which is really concealed. And like, boom, 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 boom. I loved it. I loved it so much. I was sitting in Boca with a big fat joint in my hand. <laughs> yeah. In my bathing suit. Everybody's chilling. And I'm sitting with a red book called Likotei Torah, Chasidut, by this pool. What a trip, huh? At some point, I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> that combination I'm out of here. could take you yeah, a shot. Oh, I'm, take you I'm going to Tzfat. Yeah. You know, crazies like me belong there. <laughs> I can see you fitting very well in Tzfat in that, yeah. in that scenario. 100%. It makes me wonder, like, and, and wish that, because as, as now as well, like, you know, during Yeshiva days, my Yeshiva days... Um, I didn't really appreciate. I didn't appreciate, to be very honest, the the Torah that was being taught to me, the Chassidus, the Tanya, and only now in my later years, in my twenties, that I when I got reintroduced and started sitting down, it's like, wow, this was taught to me back then, and I, wow. there's a disconnect because all this is right in front of us. I'm right. reading, you know, self development books, self help books, and I'm like, wait a second, these these ideas and thoughts are something that I've heard beforehand, and I open up the Tanya, open up different Mamarim, and it's all there. And what I love about it is that if I if I when I when I have a chavrusa and I study, it goes even a bit deeper than these books and these authors have to say. It's like it says all that and more. And so I realize, I mean, there's a disconnect. There's, we have it all, hundred percent. We always hear from our teachers, oh, it's all in the Torah, and hundred percent true. Right. But how is it packaged? How is it delivered to us? And you know, sometimes it's 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 lost in translation, right? Totally. So, anyways, back to your story. So you're you're there. You're tripping out. You're getting. Yeah, I'll skip a few years. Got so married. I, I come to Tzfat. Did the thing, got married. To be really honest with you, Mayor, mm. just between you and me yep. and the world that's watching this. Yeah, don't tell anybody, guys. <laughs> the real reason why I wanted to become Chabad was I really dig the Chabad girls. Hey, oh! <laughs> that's it. That's what they say. They say, uh, yeah. you know, the, the Rebbe give a bracha, no? They say if um if if they you said learn ten parakim of Tanya, you know the wife will be at ten. If you learn nine parakim of Tanya, really, you, yeah. I never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember I went to this when I first becoming you know hanging out in Crown Heights. I was like I went over to this matchmaker. I was like, listen, I love the Chabad girls. Can you hook me up with one? She looks up me up and down like mm, no. Why is she Why is she reject you? No beard. Because of, no beard. No ah, hat. No nothing. Okay. You know, like if you, you didn't want a Chabad girl, you better become Chabad yourself. Okay. Somewhat, the combination of that and the Hasidus and everything was like, I want to do that. Let me try that. So I came to Israel, I came to Tzfah, I went to Yeshiva, and before you know it, got married to a Chabad girl, Psh. where I'm still married till today. 16 years, baby. 16 years, going strong. You don't hear, <laughs> that's amazing. All the best to you. Thank, you. thank you. That's incredible. That's beautiful. What makes that marriage work? What, how do you, you know, because day and age, right? We hear how often relationships just fall apart right what um what what secret sauce do you guys have that you you know that keeps that keeps us going never keep grudges towards each other and that's actually you know one of the most inspiring insight that when i first became inspired by lubavitch that really spoke to me you know that famous i don't mean to make turn into if i bring in a different torah this is what a podcast is for man. but talk, talk um, your heart this is really always talks to me you know there's a very interesting uh, commandment if someone has leprosy on his arm 
he's considered, you know, he's, he needs to be excommunicated for a while till he gets cured. And that leprosy is in the size of one coin on his arm. What happens if that leprosy spreads to his entire arm? Obviously, he needs to be pure, right? No. He's good to go. He's, he's okay. He's hmm. already pure. Interesting. Very interesting. I was always wondering, how come? How does that make sense? And then I read in the teachings of the Rebbe a beautiful insight. You know, you look at everything that goes on today. I mean, we're in that business, social media and the internet, and so much... You can use profanity in your podcast, so I'll keep it clean. But so much, what's the Yiddish word? Schmutz. Schmutz. Um, dirt, and feel free to dirt. be as free as you want. Yeah. And and filth is out there. Yeah. And also good stuff. Yes. But there's so much with you know with the all the perversions and porn and, and and crazy stuff that are happening. Are you telling me, for thousands of years the world was great and pure, and only now people are are so evil? Of course not. It always existed. But you know what you saw? All you saw was a little bit. You saw that leprosy in the size of a coin. And that's why it was considered impure. But Baba Chirabi says today, where everything is out in the open, leprosy has spread everywhere, this is actually a sign of purity because there's nothing worse for someone when you have grudges against someone in a relationship, in a partnership. You don't feel comfortable talking about it because you know you don't want to bring up stuff and you know ruin the day. So you, you just keep it inside of you, and it builds and it builds and it builds, and you're a walking bomb about to be exploded. All you see is a little bit. That's not your. You need to be, you need to go and take care of it. But if you let it all out, it's all out there. You're already you're in a sign of purity. So that's really what my relationship is all about. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it hurts, but you just got to talk about it. Talk about mm-hmm. what bothers you, what bothers you about me, for better or for worse. That's really on one foot. I heard that. And I, what I find is that through that communication, whether, you know, in a relationship, in a partnership, whatever that may look like, once you put the spotlight, once you mention, once you bring it out, verbalize it, it already starts the process of healing, right? It's not. It's no more exactly. like I mentioned. It's not. It's not a secret anymore. Exactly. It's not something that you're already building more stories about what, how they react, what they think they would react. It's like it's out there, and now you got to deal with it. You got to right. show up for life. You got to show up for the problem or that circumstance, and work it through together. Now it's not just by yourself, but with that partnership. That's that's a slacha, and you also have. So let me ask you. Being in this world, you know, I know growing up, um, I always had a passion for um, acting, feature films. I love performing. But always one thing that always ranked, you know, was always brought up to me when I brought up, like, hey, man, what are you going to do when you go? I want to be an actor. It was always shut down. And a lot of the big reasons were because, you know, how can you do it? Being a religious Jew, um, being from Orthodox, that world is not for us. It's not, it's not, it's, it's going to pull you away. All those kind of stuff. So someone like yourself, how, you know, who's, who wasn't really, who came from a, you know, somewhat religious home, but not fully orthodox, who chosen that kind of lifestyle. How has, you know, your lifestyle as being an orthodox Jew and filmmaking come together? And how, is that, how, has, how has that been affecting each other? Great question. And I, I got to tell you that actually, back just for a second, so I spoke about the Rebbe telling me in everything, everything, everything that you do, three times. Yeah. So I know the first one, he opened my physical eyes. I feel like he did. The second one, through the paintings, he opened my spiritual eyes and I went, Full-fledged. The third one. What is the third everything? has to be something that has to be involved with vision. And what I do today for a living, the visual arts, sure. is the third everything. So everything in my life has to do with vision, really, you know, as a result. So I feel complete. I feel very... Obviously, there are challenges. I mean, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I don't want to sound like a preacher. Let me talk. You're not preaching. Let me talk. Talk, um, talk real. Straight you know, up. Let me talk yeah, real. Yeah, 100%. Because this is not something, this is something I'm dealing with, and there's many people who are listening right. to this who are, who are interested in going to music or to, f- to films. Right. And they're coming from backgrounds, whether they're Orthodox Jews or Orthodox you know, Christians or whatever it may be, but there's always that you know, confrontation between you know, where, where they land when it comes to the things that they believe in, the principles, and also the passions. And So yeah, talk, talk straight. I could tell you that I think that youth today need to have that platform. I'm talking about youth from our community, from the Jewish, Orthodox, Hasidic community, even if you will, need to get that platform of pursuing their talents. You can't be locked in a box anymore. That's number one. Number two, whatever is going on there on social media, we need to have proper representation. Every day, and I open up, I mean, we're all addicted to the internet. Let's face it, all of us. We check our Facebook, we check our Instagram at all least time. 20 times a day. All the time. 
And most of the content on Facebook, for example, which I know Facebook is already for old school. Yeah, right. You know, no, but... you gotta talk Instagram. <laughs> you gotta talk TikTok. You gotta start. But even Instagram is getting there. Yeah. All I mean, all I see mostly are bad news. This happened in Israel. A rocket. This anti-Semitic attack. This, that, that. Oh, th- this pedophile predator was just caught. Did... Like not enough positive items out there to really inspire me. That's where we come in to really provide that. And actually, you, Mayor, are the king of that positive, happy content. And that inspires me a lot because you actually started that trend, you know, of like make, giving people a smile, making people want to do, you know, make a resolution to become better. As cheesy and cliched as it sounds, yeah, that's... it's the truth. We need that. Absolutely. So when someone comes to me and tells me, oh, it's not frum enough, it's not Hasidic enough, I don't think so. I think that we are the emissaries of the Rebbe on YouTube. We are there, emissaries of everything that we represent, everything that we were taught. We are taking it now to, to the World Wide Web and, and to the big screen and so on and so forth. Mm. And what are some, I, I, I 100% agree, and that is something that I've dedicated my life, my vision. You know, earlier in my story, I had choices to create content and join the big YouTubers who were doing pranks, who were doing a lot of, you know, stuff that people were laughing at, but not laughing with people. And that's the kind of stuff I wanted to create. And so, like, that's that's what I've dedicated. Maybe it's a, a slower road and maybe it's not as popular, um, but it's something that's more meaningful to me and something that it just brings aliveness to me within and I want to contribute to the world. That's And so it's, it's cool to see that's landing and the message is getting out there. Um, and at the same time, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm also curious to know on a personal level, what are some of the specific challenges that you went through that you, perhaps you are going through to keep right. that balance alive or you know, or how things have shifted? Okay, so let me be more personal then. I think we need a l'chaim for that. All right, this is a l'chaim, I have a l'chaim. This is a fabrengen. All right. I have a look at you. L'chaim, l'chaim. This is great, Danny. L'chaim, l'chaim. The strength to, to, to clear vision and to, and to continue inspiration, inspiring you. yourself and those who come across your, your content and, Thank your, you, my friend. and your art. Likewise. L'chaim. So when I first became involved in Chabad, involved in saying, inspired, and really, obviously, I went all the way, you know, uh, with the beard, and never went too crazy. But you know, they had the mikvah every day and every everything. Day. It's a big one. Tzitzis yamaka. Tzitzis yamaka for sure. Uh, tzitzis out, you know, everything, even white shirts, everything. The even whole the white was. shirt. Oh wow, <laughs> over the deep end, bro. <laughs> and at some point, obviously, you know, the more I became involved in this industry, you find yourself, you know being dressed casual like this. Yeah. My tissues are tucked in, unfortunately. I was actually commenting yeah. that your tissues are out and I yeah. it's really inspiring there. Thank you. Yeah. It's um it's a new it's um relatively I, for the past few months I've I've been rocking out my tissues and if you nice. look at I wear my yarmulke now as well um out outwardly in my videos. In my earlier videos you'll see I wear I wear a Mayor K hat. And I was telling myself to, you know, um, that yeah, you know the reason why I wore that was just you know for you know that's, a the YouTube a lot of YouTubers back then were wearing caps, but it was also like I wanted to keep it you know universal and light. People know who I was I was Jewish, but if I really dig deep, there was a part of it that I was I was a bit scared and embarrassed perhaps when I was doing all my social media uh, videos on the street. How would people react to me? I wanted to keep myself neutral and not really identify myself, even though I identify myself but not completely. I didn't not both feet. And over the past, I would say more recently over the past couple of years. Um, that I, I've been working on myself and identity is something which I'm super proud about and I've come to even realize how much more powerful the, the medium of video is and it's just sort of in line with myself. You know, I realized that I can't live a certain, my life as a YouTube star and then how I am on social media and then live myself with my friends and another of myself and my family. The way I live my life has to be the same throughout everything mm. I do and that's the consistency I try and authenticity I try I work on consistently throughout all my platforms of my life with every type of relationship. So yeah, it's something that I, I rock out, titsis, yarmulke, it's part of my identity. Um, and it's something that I that I enjoy. But you said the word unfortunately, and is that something that bothers you now that you it don't wear it out? It bothers me, it bothers me. I okay. wanna be more Hasidic. Mm-hmm. And one day I'm sure I will be. I'm gonna look like like a rabbi. <laughs> What's a rabbi look like? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's actually someone told me the other day, there's um, a blog, a forum, I'm sure you heard of it, 
of different rabbis and just clergy, you know, you have priests and, and one for priests, another one for rabbis, where under some Elias names, they just, you know about this one? No, no, no. They no just um, post things like a rabbi can say, I have a whole kind, you know, there's an unorthodox rabbi. Okay. There's a blog out there. It's a blog, okay, yeah. No one knows who he is. He, sa- he claims he's a rabbi of a large, very orthodox congregation. Okay. And he does weddings, he does funerals, the work. He doesn't say who he is, though. He's he does not say who he is. Or, or not, not and us. in the closet, he's an atheist. And he doesn't believe in nothing. He eats pork when no one sees shrimp. Oh, wow. Everything. And he kind of li- leads a double life. So what, on his and blog, he, what is he talking about? What's, what he talks of? about his dilemmas, uh-huh. his, his, you doubts, know, his, his doubts. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have that. Meaning, I am very... I used to be a rabbi. I don't know if you know that. I did not know that. Not an official rabbi of a community. You oh, pulpit rabbi. I'm I'm breaking it out here for the first time. Hey, oh wow, <laughs> first time. Listen, Mayor K podcast. You're gonna hear real the, the breaking news. Okay, wow. It's... So a rabbi in my own terms, obviously, for the Russian speaking community. I was actually officially here in New York, here in, New York in Manhattan Beach. Uh-huh. I was the director of outreach at the Manhattan Beach Jewish Center, and the uh, rabbi for the Russian speaking community, which. On a good day, on Yom Kippur, we had over 1,200 people wow. come to us. That's a crowd. And I've done it all. I've done weddings, and I'm actually ordained by New York State to do weddings, so let me know if you need one. Okay. I listen. got you. I got you, <laughs> You man. got me? My man, my man, L'chaim. <laughs> Soon enough. Um, I could do funerals. I got you there, too. Psh, God forbid. Okay, got me. All right, when the time comes, you know. <laughs> and, um, and I've done it all, and I've been giving advice, and it bothered me at some point. I was like thinking to myself, now that I'm a filmmaker, full house, I'm like... And sometimes, I, you know, I'm dressed casual, as I am with jeans, whatever. You know, I do my thing, the sunglasses. Obviously, I, you know, you live a certain lifestyle because you are in that lifestyle. And there are many challenges. And sometimes I, feel, I meet some of my congregants, and they're like, Rabbi Finkelman, how are you? And at first, I'm like, I want to give my rabbi voice, like, oh, hello, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> is that the rabbi voice? That's the rabbi voice. In Russian it is. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. конечно. Ну, ну, что вы? You know, I'm talking to them like that. And, but then I'm like, no, no, no. This is me right now. And I'm, I haven't changed. And I'm like, yo, what's up? How are you? Come. Like, rabbi Finkelman? So you felt like you were a split, a split personality? You were two different people? The rabbi? The, the For a short rabbi? while, I felt I have a split personality because I got to have one face you know, to that community, and another. But then, I haven't stopped. I mean, I still do the the out because the outreach that we do right now, it's a whole different kind of outreach. Maybe it's not convincing someone to put on tefillin, so to speak. But, dude, you tell me what's more important: making someone feel good about themselves, making those the the youth out there feel good about you know be more tolerant towards each other in this intolerant age that we live in right now. Yeah. Or other stuff, you know, you'll be the judge. But we all do what we can to make the world a better place. You do your thing, you do your thing, and I'll do my thing. Everybody has so their, 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 their... I have, yeah, so I absolutely have no no guilty conscience about any of that. Obviously, there are challenges. And we know the higher you get on the ladder, the more people you inspire, which I felt, you know, I was also a teacher. At the same time I was a rabbi, oh, wow. I, was all, huh? the, I was an eighth grade teacher and an assistant principal right here in uh, Yeshiva Darche Menachem. Ah, I love the Arche. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, they're great. Great, guys. great school. Really, yeah. the I do actually film a lot of. I film a lot of my the school. Anything that has a school setting, a classroom, I film at Darche. Really, they're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big shout out to uh, nice. Rabbi Mendy Vale. He's Rabbi really, Mendy Vale is amazing. He's, a, he's so worth it. I, I, yeah. I'm like a guy like Mendy Vale, who's I. I mean, listen, shout out to Mendy Vale because I find that he has a really great touch. He's with it with the kids. He has. He's so a young. True. He's young, and he has. He he gets a lot of respect. Yeah, and because he he's he really cares, he really really cares, he really and does. of course I'm biased because he allows me to film in the school. So <laughs> thank you, Mandy. But yeah, yeah and, and Rabbi Ben Sion from Darcha Menachem, a shout out to him who gave me my first opportunity when I came to America. I remember I, when I first came, my wife asked me, "Okay, what are you going to do now? Like, what are you going to do? How are you going to make money?" And I was like, um, you "Changing any cards? No, you good. You good? Yeah, he's okay." Good. And I was like, I'll be a taxi driver. I'll do whatever I can to make it. And I remember the first person I got him through some contact I met was Rabbi Ben Sion from Dachem and Nachem. And he I was like, 
Rabbi, this is what I can do. I can do music, I can sing, I can teach, I know this and this and that. Could you give me a job? And he did. He believed in me. He was the first person who believed in me, Rabbi Yal Ben Zion. And I'm, for that, I'm forever grateful for him. And um, anyway, how did I get to that? So yeah, I was the assistant principal there. Yeah. The eighth grade Rebbe, Gemara, the works. Yeah. And I've had a tremendous success rate. My discipline level was 100% because I really spoke to them at eye level. But now, I'm also an educator, but instead of reaching out just to a class of 15 students, we're reaching out to 150,000 students, to 5 million students through YouTube and so on. So I, I'm really, and, and the more you inspire, the more challenges you have your way. Obviously, you know, the other side is gonna try to pull you down. No doubt. So Danny, some real talk. You know, you're talking, we're talking about the haters and that, you know, stuff we, people come and go, comments, it's great. We know, we take criti- criticism, I get that. But what are some of those inner inner demons, inner thoughts that are just going, on, going on in you right now? And right. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you face that? I think every artist really goes through this. And Yeah, yeah, that's nice. You're generalizing that. right there. I want to say, right. Danny, Mr. Finkelman, <laughs> what's going on in that head of yours? No, I, I'm saying like... Well, What's going on in my head is something yes. I didn't invent the wheel on that end. I sure. mean, every morning or every other morning, you <laughs> get up and you think to yourself, "Am I doing what's right? Am I am I really doing something that I believe in? Am I doing something good? Is this project going to lead me somewhere, or am I just wasting my time?" A lot of self doubt that really bring you down. So you're battling with different, you know, with some insecurities and so on and so forth. But I got to tell you. One of the main ingredients in the Hasidic community, in the Chabad, Lubavitch Hasidic community, that speak out to me, it's called the Chatchila Reber. Which means? Which means go straight to the top. No time now for step by step. People ask me, so when is Danny getting his Oscar? I'm like, it's coming. I truly, really believe in it. Meaning, I, if you're motivated, if you're ambitious as hell, you are going to reach that top. Yes, I have my down moments. I definitely do. And when I do, you know, it's like you f- you don't you feel almost depressed. You can't move. You're like paralyzing. Paralyzed. It's paralyzing like nobody likes me, nobody likes my work. Nobody really they they they're lying. He's lying, she's lying. Right. It's all like, uh, you know. I'm like, you know, totally relate. Maybe I should just go into real estate or something. <laughs> right. Like, like, Money's right. right. You're a good spokesman, you're a good salesman. Yeah, just it's go like, there. Like Am I, do, do I really think I'm a good filmmaker? Maybe I'm really not. Maybe I'm just fooling myself. You know, these are real filmmakers. You know, a lot of that. A lot of those insecurities. And a lot of challenges along the way. I mean, you meet different people that you want to meet, different people that you don't want to meet, and you meet them anyway. There are many, many challenges that come your way. And I feel I'm much more challenged now in this, what I do now, as opposed to my previous life. But, hey, it comes with a price. You want to be at the top? It's going to come with a big price. But be focused on that prize. Don't be distracted. Don't be confused. And you'll, be, you'll reach there. That's what I'm telling myself, basically. How do you... So when those doubts, those insecurities arise, I'm not good enough, my things, what am I wasting my time for? Should I go into something else? How do, what do you say to yourself? Or what practices do you do? What rituals do you have to get through those moments? Interesting. I literally may feel like I'm in a therapy session. So thank you. I'm, I'm kidding you not. I really feel... I'm, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking because for... I don't really talk about this stuff with people. Speaking and, of holding grudges. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, this is, this, is, this is real and this is something that I can relate to as a creator, as a creative. Right. And like you mentioned, you open, you're generalizing, but it's super true. Like I, I for myself, go through that process, right? I, I, of self-doubting myself. I'm like, is it good enough? Why is it good? So it went viral. So what? It had nothing to do with me. Um, what right. am I going to do next? Oh my God, maybe I should go into real estate. I'm not making so much money. And I, like... All that kind of stuff I can relate to and connect with, um, and and for a while it did bring me down. And, and sometimes, and when I didn't, uh, when I allowed that to take me over, it paralyzed me, and I stopped, yeah. and I, and burnt me out, and I got distracted and tried other things. Um, so for me, what it is um, is that I, what I find for myself is to a work on the projects that that motivate me that I want to create right so every time I find myself getting lost I take a moment I breathe I start actually journaling now I take time um, to do that to reflect uh, meditation and also to like think okay let me do something fun 
to that, you know, even though perhaps it's not a pay gig, it's not a sponsorship, let me do something fun that will bring me back to my youth, so to nice. speak, or to, to the beginning of it all. And bring back that fun. Like I was saying earlier, like if it's not fun, then why are we doing it? So um, I, I do that also a support system, right? Having good friends, um, a supportive family um, that, that I can reach out to, you know, a, a, you know, like a, a sponsor, right? Hey, what's up? This is what I'm feeling right now. Someone who I, can, who I trust, who's supportive, right. who could, you know, reinstill that, you know, those positive thoughts in my head. I'm like, wait a second, man, calm down. That's your own dialogue. Bring it back to center. That's some of the practices. But what, what, what about for you? First and foremost, again, I got to give full credit to my wife. Yeah. My beautiful wife, Tsipi, supports me. She gives me so much support. Listen to this. When I was still doing music videos, and I still do them occasionally just because I'm, I'm passionate about music, but when I was only doing music videos, she was such a she's such a big fan that if I tell her here watch this great music video done by someone else, it's a great music video. Like no no I do not want to see it. I'm I'm not interested <laughs> in seeing anything that's not done by you, Danny. Oh, she's that's a real beautiful. she's giving that support system that you mentioned. She is it. I don't need anything else. She's giving me full support. Wow, beautiful. Otherwise, what I do when I have those down moments and when I feel insecure about me as a creator. I literally sit and watch old videos that I've done and read the comments and and try to be inspired by my own by my own content like maybe I'm not that bad you know maybe I've done some good stuff just to pick up my motivations um, otherwise absolutely to do stuff that you love to do stuff and actually like these days there isn't a day that goes by where I'm like Danny what about this what about this project this project that project this music video that documentary I thank God I came to a position where I pick and choose with a tweezer what I want to be involved in. It's already overflowing, but nevertheless, Incredible. you know, stuff that really make a difference for me that I, I can really express when I say me, me and my team. It's always me in collaborating with my team to express what we want to bring out. So that's really what it is. That's, thank you for appreciate the sharing and the honesty. That's so uh, on, a, on a latter note, uh, let's go. What are how do you? I mean, I know for myself and for creators, a lot of projects are c come your way, and as you're growing, how do you how do you choose? How do you choose? You know what you want to get involved with. What do you want that you, know, you want to spend your time and energy on? Uh, do you find a balance that you take on certain projects that may just pay the bills and some that are creative? How does that look for you? Right. So obviously, at first, we're all hustling. We're still hustling in some way. But at first, it was surviving. I'll do anything just to pay the bills. What do you want to shoot? Um, you know, a detergent ad for Moish's Grocery? I got you. Let's do it. You know, whatever it is. Done. You're right. That's yeah. about get a guy. Get this tripod. And yeah, light. get the DSLR. Boom, 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 boom. And boom. Now, I'm much more careful. What am I attaching my name to, obviously? Yeah. And I just want to do stuff that are really creative. So... Music videos, I'm, I'm all about music. Music makes me cry, makes me happy, makes me sad, gives me nostalgia, you know, like everything. I live music. So I can't really get away from the music videos, but I try to, the way it works, it's the other way around. If I hear a beautiful song that I like, I'm like, I want to do a music video for this track. Because most artists don't have the, the right funding for, to do something. Right. I want to do a music video, and I want to do it in, let's see, where's my... Um, the globe? Globe. Here. Wow. Like, I'm dying to do something in Nicaragua. I love it. So, right. I was like, I was telling Garabas, he has a great new track called The Jungle Song. It's so good. It has a Jamaican rapper on it. Amazing. I'm like, God, we're doing it in Nicaragua. It's going to cost us an arm and a leg, but let's do it. I have, we have some crazy ideas about that. And that's why I want to pause right there because one thing that you're incredible at, Danny, and I don't know if you acknowledge that or not, but one thing you're known for is that you're an incredible producer. Like, directing, all that, fantastic. But one thing is you're, everybody knows for you that you're a great producer, that you get jobs done. And not just that, you're able to, and you can mention, right, a lot of the, in the, in the Jewish world, in the Orthodox world, the singers, not, they don't have big budgets, right? right? They don't have big budgets. Yet somehow you pull off these crazy, wacky, you know, location music videos with all these dancers, all these different elements, and like you attach these sponsors. You know, how do you do that? You know, you're, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So first of all, to be quite honest with you, I hardly make money on these music videos. I really don't. It's all about the... I'm... Like, some producers would be like, okay, I have a $30,000 budget. 
I'm going to keep 15 and the other 15, I'm going to, you know, I'm not, I don't think like that. I'm thinking to myself, 30,000. Yes, we can get this, le those lenses, that camera, that location, that, 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 that. If I go away, if I walk away with two or 3,000, <laughs> I'm happy right. for that location. That's because I have others that sustain me. So I can allow myself to put everything in the budget into, and obviously, you know, just to be creative and think out of the box, like, like the L'chaim music video with God Elbaz. I'm like, yeah, we should totally have a shtetl music video, but Nissim Black, an African-American convert who became Breslev, he should be the rabbi of that 19th century shtetl. That would be wacky. That would be something to break, something you know. Something edgy, something different. Yeah. And obviously it's, it's thinking of all the details because sometimes you have great cameras, you have great crews, great gear, and you miss on the most important ingredient sometimes to feed the crew, to feed uh -huh. them well, to right. motivate them. Right. You know, it's all about those little details, but, you know, I already have others who are doing that for me at this point and trying to, I don't want to, sound like i'm tapping my own back here but no 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 no. i'm um but i thank you for the compliments i really do obviously music is something that really speaks to me and that's why i would put everything i can to those music videos that's mm -hmm. what i really want to say what is your favorite music video that you didn't make oh i was waiting for that last word <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't make my fa oh my favorite music videos done by someone else Some, done mean? by somebody else yeah something that you weren't part of I gotta think about that one. Um, before I get into your videos, I, uh, no, 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 don't be honest. It's I'm not honest. Good. I have colleagues who are yeah. my favorite colleagues in in the world to work with. The okay. Oriam brothers. In oh, Israel. they're great. Yeah, well, out I'm of Israel, alone. the two brothers. Yeah, fantastic, yeah, yeah. fantastic, fantastic. Such and they're speaking of collaboration. Yeah, they have absolutely they're so humble mm. it's it's beyond I haven't me. yet to have the privilege of working with them oh, yet, they're, but they're I, amazing and creative yeah, yeah and they have no problem like and it came to such a point where more than three or four projects recently i was like aaron although it's my it's my gig i got this job and usually i'm always the director the director director producer mm -hmm. over here you'll be the director i'm going to be the producer just Let's, I trust him to that much. Wow. And, um, and that's really the kind of work environment that I like to have with the colleagues. Like, hey, why don't you direct it? We're all going to produce this and stuff like that, other stuff. So um, they've done definitely some Is great there a stuff. Music video, one of the music videos that, you, that really sticks out for you? That they did? Yeah. I liked the, I don't remember the name of the song, but one of the Shweki music videos that they've done was, was really nice. Nice. I mean, you know, nothing blew me away musically, but no offense, <laughs> Shweki. Shweki, yeah. No offense, Shweki, but <laughs> okay. uh, Shweki is great. It's great. The video really enhanced that, that song, song to to, totally. to a whole. I really, really loved uh, Ivry Anochi. Ivry that, Anochi. That you made. Love that. It's, Thanks. you know, just the vibes there. The... The good spirits and the really the message is so clear, and that's really some music videos, even mine, are lacking, unfortunately, because sometimes you 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 have everything. You get lost in all that, but dazzle. you miss the message. Like, mm. what are you trying to say? It's beautiful, but what's your point? Right. That music video really had that strong message, and it was done beautifully. And one more thing that I like about that video, I was actually uh, interviewed recently about a whole article in the Forward magazine that they're writing about. In the or, how Orthodox Jews treat women. Oh, yeah, okay. and the whole Me Too movement okay, and constantly. putting them in the media. Sure. And they came to me because obviously I was the one insisting on putting, including women, in all the my music, music videos, videos from yeah. day one. And I got a lot of slack for it. Totally. Got we it also got Lipa. some for Ivory. Right. Oh, that's exactly my point. We got some for Ivory, but for having a guy like Benny Friedman. Yeah. And Bob, Lipa was known to be out of the box. Sure. But a guy like Benny Friedman, who comes from straight from the community, to oh. have women. Yes. It was everybody was like, "Whoa, this is a whole new phase." And it was a credible phase. And to be honest, so how was that? So behind the scenes of that, um, we I pushed that tremendously in it. And when it came down to the editing room, they wanted to leave that on the floor. They, they wanted to really? take out those bits. Wow. And I really pushed and stood for that because I and, I, and Benny was and kudos to Benny. He also understood the power of it because let's be honest, right? We're talking about Ivory Nochi, talking about Jewish people, identity, being proud. Women are a very much big part of that. Um, but so we did some um, some testings with with different people, friends, family. There were some people who said take it out. Some people said yes. I really pushed for it, and I'm very happy with the decision that we left it in. 
Most of it, and I gotta say, there was some slack from the usual. Of course, there's people still a, a, a shift in consciousness and acceptance, but it was really nice to get a lot of positive feedback. People were like, "Wow, this is so good to see women being represented in a positive light in in, in Orthodox yeah, music beautiful. videos." So yeah, I think and it's, 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 we have that, that was one of the best Jewish music videos I've ever watched, and I could watch it over and over again. Wow. So kudos to you, Mayor. Really, thank you. Thank really wow, good. Danny. Oh, coming no, from bro, the king really, of music videos. So really, thank you. It's uh, amazing stuff. Thank you. Yeah, and kudos to Benny and to the whole team that yeah, created yeah, an incredible sure. song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I heard that drop, I remember sitting with Benny Struli and Artisan Bakehouse, and they're like, "Yo, this is Benny's new song, great song." And then that drop came in, like, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, "Yes!" Yeah. I, and that's also really cool to see as well as music transitions, right? Oh, yeah. Like, there's a lot more EDM oh, yeah. being thrown in. Exactly. A lot more. Um, we're expanding from trumpets and 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 and, yeah. and, and drums. Yeah, and I've done some intense stuff in music video, like recently, uh, "Set Me Free," "Describe." Oh yeah. It was uh, there's a actually a trigger warning on that music video on the title of that music video because we that. actually showed we actually cut some stuff out because it was much worse if I show the the what uh, was original the context? cut. Tell me the context. Context the... is about um, someone who went through sexual abuse, and we actually see his flashbacks being abused a bit, and then on the verge of suicide, and we actually see him commit suicide. Um, heavy. Very heavy. Very heavy. Very very heavy. But you know what? The amount of positive feedback I got on that video, and I've done that actually with the Orion brothers. So I actually got him to be directed by me and him together mm -hmm. on this video. And sure. yeah, and um, so these are the kind of stuff that I, you and, know. And, and it's statements. a forefront because it's something like addiction, which is prevalent and very much, you know kept secret and there's still a stigma right. around it to bring it to the forefront through media through video is, is it's controversial and people I'm sure are upset about that like oh this should be dealt behind right. curtains and yet from my experience and, and having friends and knowing people who have um, overdose who have who are suffering with addiction um, drug addiction all types of addictions um, it's something that has to be spoken, right? Addiction thrives in secrecy. That's where it lives, in the aloneness of the psyche. Where, exactly. Where and so messages like that, when it's brought to the forefront, I think done, done in a healthy way, it's so, it's so important. And it's so incredible to, to see that message being shared. And that's the kind out. of messages that I like to highlight, to have, not just have a, you know, jilly jolly music video, moving your hands here up and down, right. but it's more like, what's the message behind it? Whether it's, um, you know, talking about tolerance, you spoke about the Holocaust survivors. Yeah. Um, this guy, I got to tell you, Soul Dryer, you met him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah. You met him back at, the, uh, at that uh, event. And Soul is an incredible person. Yeah. So this was actually my first interaction with Josh Weinstein, the director of Menashe. Oh, Menashe, sure. You got to talk about so that. So he came, he came over to me and was like, I have an, I have an idea. I want to do a feature-length film about the Hasidic community. I don't know about what. I don't know about anything. So I'm like, you know what? Let's collaborate first on something else. And we've both done, um, I produced it, a short film for the New York Times, with like a New York Times op-ed about the Holocaust survivor man. Mayor, you know, oh, talking about inspiration, yeah, talk to me. this guy is a living legend. I mean, think about it. We all, as teenagers, had dreams of becoming actors and actresses and singers and artists. Reality Bites... You know, you, you do your thing. You go to college or you go to yeshiva, get married. Reality bit him too, big time. He had those dreams. He had a dream of becoming a musician back in Krakow in the 1930s. But then World War II happened. Mm -hmm. He was actually working in Oscar Schindler's factory, speaking of Schindler's List. Oh, wow. And in the flash of notorious concentration camp, his family was murdered. His parents were murdered in front of his eyes. And he went through hell. Came out, no more dreams of that. It's just about surviving, coming to America, yeah, hustling. I think he was a plumber or an electrician. And then, thirty years ago, he retired. What? Are, and he lived. He moved to Florida, like many other our good Jewish brothers and sisters do. What they do when they retire. But then, four years ago, at the age of ninety, Soul Dryer gets up one morning and says, "Uh, uh, 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 uh." I'm not ready to die just yet and sit in a wheelchair in a nursing home in Florida and put on my dentures. No, no, no. I'm going to pursue my childhood dream of becoming a musician now at the age of 90. Wow. And hell he did. Wow. Soul Dryer today has gigs all over the world. They take him everywhere. In fact, the World Jewish Congress just released a video 
about Soul Dry. He's like their poster boy for their We Remember campaign about to come up. Incredible. I've done, together with you also, I think about five or six music videos. The latest one I've done in last week. Amazing. In Long Island with God Elbaz and Benny Elbaz. We've been in Berlin at the Brandenburg Gate. We've been in Warsaw. Coming back in that, wow. Coming back to it's Berlin. In that capacity, right? I mean, 80 years later. I mean, think about it. He was telling me, and this guy, he, he knows how to express himself. Oh, and he loves life. I mean, this guy is an inspiration. Oh, yeah, you see him in the videos. Right? He, he just is glowing. Oh, my God. I wish I had the same energy that he has. It's He's amazing. like, Danny, I shouldn't say this in public, but he tells me, but he loves dining and women and good wine and he's like all for it daddy let's go where's the party at 94 years old there's an aliveness about him exactly he's alive and all odds to, to tell you you went through the holocaust your family was murdered fine be alive in the 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s 2019 he's still alive and kicking how old is he now 94 94 and that old. tells you if he survived the holocaust and is still alive Boy, do we have hope. We're good. We're good. <laughs> that is incredible. We, gotta get, we have to get on the podcast. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Totally. That's amazing. That's, ama- that's so inspiring that life comes at you in such a horrific way, like yeah. the Holocaust, which we can't even fathom. And every excuse to give up on life, every excuse to give up on, 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 on hope and, and connection and love and possibilities. Right. And you fight through that. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. But these are the kind of stuff that I'm, those powerful, inspiring stuff that I really want. That's what I like to get involved in. Musically, documentary, and short or feature length films, which I got involved recently. Stuff that really speak out and make a difference. What is a, for those people who are out there right now who are looking to create, what are some, what are some tips and, and ways for them to be able to fund or to get started just to get okay. started how great could, question how could someone yeah get, get moving on you know i have so many artists who come to me like danny i wrote a screenplay what do you think danny i have a song could you do a music video danny 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 and what really it's not even about the song necessarily yet or how amazing the script is it's all about how motivated is that person in front of me if i see someone who's so highly motivated it's contagious yeah And then when you see that, I remember one of my first, you asked about sponsors. Yes. I remember like one of those music videos that I've done. I went to meet this old timer businessman tycoon in the city, Manhattan. I'm sitting there and I just, I'm just, I just started out. It looks at me and you know, I'm sure you can relate as a director. I I, got to make that point, by the way, before I talk about that, it's all about making decisions. Sure. And saying the right stuff and knowing what to say. Never be unprepared. I remember in one of my first gigs, I was in Poland, actually, on a music video set. And I didn't really know much about lenses and cameras. I knew that I'm interested and I know what I'm doing. I'm the freaking director. And there's a whole crew of like 30 people <laughs> in and out and, and actors and cast. Yes. And she comes to me like, so, Danny, um, are we doing this in the 35 or the 50? Tell me now. Damn, um, 50. I had no idea what <laughs> I'm saying. Yeah, 50. yeah. It's all about confidence. I see. It's all about confidence, and that really talks to people. People want leadership. I don't care if it's wrong, but they want someone who is decisive. So anyway, I'm sitting there at this meeting, and it's like, um, I'm talking about you know this project that I'm about to do, and he looks at me like, listen, kid, do you have any experience in filmmaking? Do you have, did you do anything? Did you direct anything? Did you produce anything? What's your I, resume? What's your resume? At that time, I wasn't even on IMDb. Are you on IMDb? Like, mm. what are you blabbering about? Like, bring me someone real. I, pu- I put my hand into a fist. I banged on the table and said, Sir, I'll tell you one. I may not have experience, but I have one thing. Passion. Now take that. Because the passion is what I have. And that's really what's going to create this, bring this project to life. And that was, that was really what sold. So you're asking me about artists who are trying to really make it there. If they really have passion, if they believe in what they do, if they take a loan from the bank to sponsor their own first music video because that's how much they believe in it, I'll be like, you know what? I got you. Don't worry. I see how passionate you are. I want to be connected to you. I want to be motivated by you because that's what I was saying to you before. Inspirational people, ambitious people inspire me. Mm. Wow, and you're and you really live that 
for yourself, which is amazing. So to switch it up, I want to just do quickly a a speed round. All right, whatever comes first to your mind, you have to say. Uh oh. Here we go. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Horror or comedy? Comedy. Short films or feature films? Feature. L.A. or N.Y.C. N.Y.C. Hulu or Netflix? Netflix. What are you binging now? What are you binging? What are you watching these days? I'm binging. Well, I obviously finished The Handmaid's Tale, which is on Hulu. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Love that show. Speaking Haven't of seen women it, and amazing. Orthodox and all that. Uh-huh. And um, Shtisel obviously was a biggie on Netflix. Um, Miss Maisel, you know, all the good stuff. Yeah. And you had a, 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 fe- a recent feature film, Menasha, that did quite well in the in the in the uh, in the circuit around uh, the the indie film festivals. Film right. festivals, the film festivals. How? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, how did that come to be? I know that the reception was amazing. It was a very interesting um, right. film that really took us a authentic way into the ultra orthodox uh, Hasidic world. Right. So I actually we premiered it at Sundance. At Sun, it was premiered at Sundance. Yeah, yeah it premiered Fantastic. at Sundance. Wow. Selected and premiered and. Yeah. great reviews but from the New York Times to the Washington Post and at Sundance at the premiere I was sitting next to Menashe himself that actor who never ever was in a movie theater so this was his first time watching himself in a movie watching the big screen wow <laughs> I have pictures of that I can show you that's and nuts sitting there blown like, away oh my god and right after the film some we had like the Q&A and, and this lady got up and like listen I'm from the Midwest never really met Jews I just know, you know, Jewish characters like Woody Allen and Adam Sandler. And she said, I was touched to the deepest core. This is the first time I'm actually seeing your culture on that end. Mm. So this was a film that for 70 years, there wasn't any movie in Yiddish. This is a Yiddish film. Yes. In Yiddish, Incredible. you know. And is it true that the director had no idea what, how to speak Yiddish? Of course not. Right. He had a headset. So how, do yeah. you, how do you make that happen? How does that happen? Right. <laughs> how, does that, is that, how, is you, how are you directing the actors who are speaking in a language that you don't know? Like, how does that all, how did that all take place? That's actually the brilliance of Josh Weinstein, the director. Yes. Because he, it's not even about what you say, it's about the subtle, what you don't say. Mm. It's how you, the facial expressions, and not over the top facial expressions, just like being subtle about it, feeling it. And Josh was like, if I'm going to feel it, the audience is going to feel it. And they did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I definitely remember seeing it, and it's something that stuck with me. I actually had the privilege to be Menashe. And by the way, let me tell you just one more thing. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair, fair. The most of the film was shot right here in this office, so you're sitting actually on the set of Menashe. Are you kidding? I kid you not. That is great, and that <laughs> this reminds me of a great. There's a great tip as well for those who are like maybe on short budgets. Like if you have friends who have offices, who have houses, who a right. park. You know, utilize that. Reach out. Totally. Use the resources, the locations that are, don't won't cost you anything. You yeah. don't need permits for. Or if you have permits, better ask. You know, forgiveness and permission. So, yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. go out, do it. You know, rock the boat a bit. It's okay. You know, you'll keep on living. Um, he's a great actor, Manasha. Manasha is actor. great. He's so authentic. He's so real. Yeah. He's so real. The way you find him on stage, on, on film, is the same way you'll see him on the street. And you can find him somewhere the, in Brooklyn, the, Williamsburg. Totally. Right? <laughs> he's just the, living there. And the biggest compliment great. that we got was that our executive producer was none other than Chris Columbus, the director of wow. Harry Potter, of Home Alone, of Mrs. Doubtfire, of all those great films who came on board our little indie tiny movie in Yiddish yeah. and truly believed in it. And he was the one telling Menashe, Menashe, I think you're one of the best actors I've ever got to work with. Wow. Chris Mr. Columbus. Columbus told him this. Yeah. Fantastic. That is amazing. It's funny. I do have, you ha- I have been seeing more lately in these in feature films, um, unknown actors coming to, coming to the big screen. Right. Sometimes they're kids, sometimes they're adults. Who they just handpick, yeah, and sometimes yeah, they yeah. want that because it's like this, like you know, authentic, like this realness that they bring. Where they don't, they haven't been tainted yet by the system, right? And they just you capture that online. Uh, I'm sorry, on on film, which is um, which is incredible. Danny, I'm having way too much fun. This is awesome. Um, to wrap this all up, what are you working? On, what have you been working on? Are you working on anything fresh and new that we can look out for? So I actually just wrapped a feature length film, wow. which I produced uh, along with um, some great producers. Can you share what, what was it about? And, yeah, I mean, I know it's not um, out yet, so what could you uh, share with us? It's basically like a psychological thriller slash horror movie. Whoa. Okay. Directed by Keith Thomas, who is a master of horror. In fact, he wrote, I think, about seven horror um, novels. And here I was asking you about comedy or right, horror, horror. And you're, wow. Okay, horror. But it was a great, great, great film. And, and the concept in the nutshell is, is about this young man who 
is from the Hasidic community. Mm-hmm. What you would call, um, how do you call them? The ones that are no longer in the community? Uh, off the derek? Off the derek. Oh, oh, OTD, uh, right, right. Off the derek. Off the derek. Yeah, that meaning that, yeah, I guess they, they went off the, they went their own, they took they went their, they went their own, own way. Right. Yeah. They're not and religious he, anymore. He, right, and he's suffering, and he's like freshly off the derek, freshly not religious anymore, and he suffers from some, from PTSD, and thereby take, is on medication. And he's asked by a family friend, actually played by Menashe, who has oh. a cameo in it. Okay. Asked to sit the vigil on this corpse of some old man in the community that passed just the night before. And he comes into this creepy house, and then he's not sure, as soon as he starts hearing stuff and seeing stuff, is it his because of his meds? Or is it really happening? And the crowd watching this is going to be always on the edge of it. We don't know. Is it in his head or is this really happening? That's why mm-hmm. it's so creepy, more of a psychological outlook with a very strong message as well, which I'm not going to get into now. But uh-huh. great movie. Great movie. Um, When's it going to be released? When's it going to be out of theaters? I would say by summer because it's going to go through the festival runs. Uh, it's starring the incredible Lynn Cohen. Lynn Cohen, who, is, who played in The Hunger Games, Sex in the City... Wow. Munich. All right, Incredible. Danny, good stuff. And, uh, yeah. And you, what, you were a producer on this film? I was the executive producer. Executive producer. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow, very cool to hear. So any projects that you're working on in the current moment? So I'm writing actually my first feature-length film as a director, which nice. I hope to direct. Can you share with us anything now? Uh, I could tell you that it's, go- it's taking place in the 1980s and it's based cool. on a true story. All right, enough said, enough yeah. said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to push you there. And... Um, I have a bunch of stuff that are coming out. I have a bunch of music videos that I've done already two years ago and a year ago and a half a year ago that are just um, many artists. Yehuda Green. Um, hopefully, I'm working something with Zusha right now. Cool. Love these guys. Yeah, Love those, those guys. guys. are amazing. And that's actually something I'm really looking forward. And um, yeah, some documentaries that I've done and some shorts that I already, that I was involved as a producer. One by uh, Pearl Reich. Amazing short, Castles in the Sky. I got to tell you this synopsis about this Hasidic Kala teacher, which is basically a sex ed teacher who's a Holocaust survivor who's from the Satmar community, but she teaches young brides how to go about their first night. Mm. And once a week, she takes off her wig, her tichel, and slams poetry in the village. Wow. Incredible artistic beautiful film i'll conclude with me actually getting more involved right now in the corporate world i'm working now on a lot of commercials and ads for different apps and different companies and i see myself more in that because that's where you can actually implement creativity and be part of something big because um, most companies today that's what they need most videos content and it's lacking Mm. In general, thanks to Shtisel, I know we have to wrap up, but thanks to Shtisel and all these shows, Jewish content has become much more desirable right now by so many networks. Absolutely. So we have Menashe on Amazon Prime, we have Shtisel on Netflix, and we have some other stuff going on right now. And really, it's a big hunt for content right now, and that's where we come in. And I, I j- want to conclude with just saying, I have one one of my dreams that I really want to realize one day is to do a movie or a film or some project together with you, Mayor. Ah, oh, I love to. And I'm serious because I really, truly, I'm a big fan and I you have an amazing personality and as an actor even, you, not even, as an actor, first and foremost, <laughs> as a character. Yes. You would be amazing in all these videos. Thank so you. I really hope to... Or collaborate yeah. with you as a director, me as a producer, like I said. Or whatever, whatever, however it works out, a project that both of our names are t- is together on it. Yeah, like, like, like it all began. I look forward to that, Danny. Thank you so much. Yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, man. Thank you for the inspiration that you're putting out there in the world. And much aslacha, much success to you. Thank you, man. Really. Thank and, you. And how do people want to find you? How can they find you on, on social? And- uh, sparksnext.com. Oh, social media, right. We said about oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instagram is Danny Finkelman one and the number one. Got it. Beautiful. Thanks, Danny. Have a great, great day. Thanks, bro. Keep 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 shining, man. Mm-hmm.